we've got a lot of interest in Queensland here, so I was about to come down and meet everyone and just give a bit of an update. A little bit about myself, originally from New Zealand. Always had a passion for property. When I was young and had our first home, I didn't really know about investment property. I never had anyone guiding me. Looking back, it would have been great to have information. Nowadays, there's a lot more information around about what you can do and how you can do it. Back then, there was no one really to guide me, but I just learned about how to do property. I was in the building trade, so I used to had a rendering business in New Zealand, so I used to renovate properties, bought land, built a house, built another one, done subdivisions, built brand new high cash flow property. So quite a broad range of experience over different property types and learned, I guess the biggest thing is, learned a lot along the way. So when we're taking information and guidance from people about property investment, you should really be listening to people that have been there and done that, because that's always a bit of a guide, and I'm certainly learning. A little bit about the agenda that we're going to cover off tonight, this afternoon, sorry. So done by Dave, so criteria we used are the real key points that we need to get right for our first property. 90% of property investors don't get past their first property. And the reason they do that is they don't have someone guiding them and the first property isn't a success and we've all heard those horror stories. So it's important to get the first one right because that'll give you the confidence to keep building your property portfolio. And I know there's people in the room that have got multiple properties and done it right and been very successful. So that's the biggest thing is having someone guiding you that's got that experience. Knowing your numbers, number two and two there, the yield cash flow is very important. When I built my first investment property, again, I didn't have really anyone to guide me. But I just jotted the numbers down and the figures and make sure that I could afford to hold that property. And it's something we're going to cover today is really important. So having the information and the technology to be able to work out the yield or the income of the property. So we're not relying on someone else and yields. So for those of you to property investing, things to learn are vacancy rates, yields. So if someone's quoting a yield on an investment property, always ask the question, is that gross or net? So the gross yield is like when you get paid. So you pay tax and you get gross. ATO takes the tax out you get to spend the net. Same with property investment, it's really the net return, which is most important. Elephant in the room, interest rates, uh, probably every second property investor I speak to is concerned about the interest rates. As we all know, they are going up. We have had an amazing run of low interest rates, but just because interest rates don't go up doesn't mean that the property prices will fall. In New Zealand, my first property interest rates were 20%, 20%, unbelievable. The property still grew. The last time we had interest rate rises, as Kamish will tell you, was around 2010, 2011 and property prices in Sydney have been booming for 10 years. So interest rates aren't directly related to property prices, there's a number of factors. Property prices are more related to supply and demand. So again, a lot of what you'll hear in the media, for those that listen to what's happening in the news, it's very sensationalised and it's not always correct. So based your decisions and information on correct information. When COVID came out, the news was talking about property prices dropping by 20 or 30%. Those people that listened to that and didn't buy have missed out on 30% growth over the last 18 months. So. Just remember, interest rates are important, they are a factor, but just because they're rising doesn't mean property prices will fall. So some areas, it's more related to supply and demand, and that's why we're seeing changing markets at the moment. Where to find high cash flow property, so we're talking today about that interest rate and cash flows, and uh, having those properties that are gonna give you a higher income will allow you to hold those properties even when there's interest rate rises, having that safety margin so we don't have to sell the property and give up our dream of building a portfolio, we can afford to hold that property. So we're going to be covering higher cash flow type properties and going through the numbers in quite a bit of detail Then using software that's going to show you how to calculate that. We're going to show you how to pay your home loan off. So if anyone's got a home loan, I think the biggest question we all have is, do we want to pay a home loan off? And I think that's a really important thing. It's not only the investment property is growing in value. We're, we're using that income, if it's surplus income, pay our home loan off faster. So we met maybe two, what, two years ago, roughly, we started to yeah. yeah. So uh, I bought a property in Coomera, uh, in Queensland. It's my second investment property. I live 20 minutes to 25 minutes from here, so I needed something over there to look for a property. I, I, I have a, I don't want to to buy a property here, but I need an investment property. It's a little too expensive, so I was looking for payment process, and I was looking for a positive cash flow property. Uh, found Jeff from online. Started the chat and said, Hey, I need someone to be my eyes and ears over there in Queensland. He seemed to know the area quite well. Um, we went through a few uh, properties and finally landed with one. Uh, again, my criteria was different from yours. Mine was more, let's get something that's, that pays, the rent pays off the, the loan. Uh, and uh, I wanted one that can have a higher growth yield and also, uh, you know, hopefully a potential for rent to also increase over time. Uh, good news is the property that I bought a year ago, 
uh, has increased in value uh, over the last 65 years, probably know more now, because my first just told me I haven't even been in touch with it. But rent actually has gone up by 100 bucks a week over the last two, three months, so it's been better for 10 years now. Uh, so that's massive. That's big. It's really quite a big surprise. So, uh, so I've been lucky, so I find it probably. And uh, as I said, having someone there with uh, contacts over there, from, from property agent to uh, someone doing inspections, has been very useful for myself. Uh, any questions? You're welcome to ask Sean. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I had my what are some of the like? What are some of the things that um, will the first thing when you look at property you notice whether it's going to be a good property to buy? There's a number of things, and we'll cover that in the event. But good question. So the things like uh, we talked about, don't buy a dud. You know, the first question there was find the right location, buy a property where there's rental demand and income, and make sure that you've done the cash flow forecast which is what we did with Sean. Sean hadn't visited the property, so he's based in Sydney. I haven't actually seen the property yet, so far, so But this, for this particular one, this is my second one, the second investment, but this, this one I actually haven't seen yet so far. So. Yeah. But then, last time we filled it, it didn't work. Yeah, so it's gone up in value. Um, I know that area quite well. I've got a, uh, we've got an investment property just probably two kilometers from where Sean owns his property. Um, my daughter built a new house and land for her, probably about two kilometers from Sean's property. And she recently got a bank valuation that had gone up 150K. Um, she signed the contract maybe two years ago. The property's been finished just over 12 months. So fantastic. Now imagine trying to save that 150K. She's a family with two kids, mum, dad working, very difficult. So, um, and Sean's property would be the similar sort of figures based on his purchase price and now. Um, great, and the rental is, what did the rent start off at? Well, it started at uh, 530, then went up to 550, and recently it's gone up to 630. So that's massive, $100 a week, you know, it's five grand a year extra income on top of what we forecast only 14, 15 months ago, you know. Any other? Where did you buy your first? Uh, it was further down the north. Uh, it's uh, yeah, further north of that property. So it was in a, under the council called Logan, which is in between the Gold Coast and Brisbane. It was a, that was actually a build, it was an actual building. Yeah. Was, that, was that recently? Ah, uh, that was four years ago. Yeah. It's still there, so it's a dual income property. Mm -hmm. It's got the house and the and stuff like that. And we're going to cover dual incomes today, actually, in the presentation on the property side of it, so we'll explain. So, And that's why it's important to have the right advice and base your purchase on your, you know, your position. So Sean's first property, the dual rock, was very strong in cash flow. The second property source, a source for Sean was probably more for capital growth, you know, so you're getting that balance, you know. I, I think for me it was more in terms of whether I was my risk profile. I didn't want to take too much of a risk, so I didn't want to invest in Sydney. Uh, and I said, okay, I probably need to find something that could grow, uh, not doing things that well enough, and then something that's more my the growth. All good. Thank you, Sean. Much appreciate it. <laughs> so it's good that, you know, it's, it, it start to. Listen to people that have been here, done that, learned, we all learn as experiences. And, and if anyone's guiding you on property, ask them, you know, can I speak to someone, at least you've heard now from a client. So you mentioned, asked about the criteria, you know, what to look for in terms of your first investment property or any investment property to be uh, really frank. Um, areas with population growth. So the property prices going up or down are more about demand. So you want to be going investing in areas where the population is growing. Australia's population spread around Australia is changing. And we're going to cover those figures today. So population growth, uh, vacancy rates under 3%. So would you like me to explain what a vacancy rate is? Because, yeah, okay. So a vacancy rate of 3% means that for every 100 properties listed for rent, only three are vacant. So 3%, if you just remember, 3% is considered a very tight market. So if you're investing in a unit in Melbourne, the vacancy rate at the moment might be 9 or 10%. So um, anything under 3% is a good thing, okay? So vacancy rate is very important. Uh, locations on the property clock. So again, for those new to property investing, we call it the clock. So 12 o'clock is the top of the market when we've gone through massive growth. Then the property normally stays stagnant, starts to fall in value a bit, gets to the bottom, which is six o'clock. And it's really that um, nine to 12 o'clock when we see that growth. Um, so a lot of experts, which I agree on, is it's time in the market, not timing of the market. 
because we don't know the best time to buy and we don't know the test, best time to sell because we just don't know the future. But what we know is if you ask anyone in the room that's had property in Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne over and owned property the last 10, 20 years, it's performed you know, very well. So we can't go into the short-term growth. If you're going to area with this low vacancy rate, population growth, that property will grow in value. The fastest way to get that equity growth is to work out where you're looking to invest and try and invest on in that, as I mentioned, that nine to 12 o'clock, you know. Um, and in Sean's case, that was the case just at the right time. Uh, property market's gone really well there. Um, cash flow positive, so again, having that more income than expenses. So that means if the interest rate rises, we have a week or two without a rental income, we can still afford to hold that property. So cash flow, um, for, for especially for your first property, is really important. So where the property's going, because if it's cash flow positive, whether the market's going up or down or sideways, it's not going to cost you anything per week if it's cash flow positive. Low maintenance, uh, in low maintenance type properties, so um, fall in love with the numbers, you know, uh, it's all about that. So older high maintenance type properties can really cost you, and that's where a lot of people get, you know, frustrated. Um, so in Queensland and a lot of parts of Australia, Sydney's the same, a lot of old timber weatherboard homes look great, have provided quite good capital growth, but um, if you're maintaining that as an investor, a lot of money and it just really sinks your cash flow, especially when you're just getting started and just want the first one to be putting income or covering itself. Um, when you buy your own home, that's okay. You can go home and renovate on the weekends and nights. I've done it many, many times over the years, but one. Something I've noticed between Sydney and Queensland, just such a big difference in the years. For whatever reason, maintaining a property that's not as expensive as Sydney. So I'm just giving an example. We had to cut down tree was off last week. Uh, because the neighbors next door were saying it's blocked the sunlight. If you were paying such a thing in Sydney for your new rent, they say, Well, it does not make sense. Wow. It was such a big difference. And so I was not surprised when you think it was a difference. Just like that. No, it's good. And that 850 that's probably 15 20 dollars a week that you've saved, you know, in the first year. So, um, so your yeah, low maintenance type properties where it's affordable and it's not gonna, the budget's not gonna blow out, you know, so we can do the cash flow fairly accurately. Um, and recommendations based on your strategy. So again, as property investors, we're at a different stage. If we're getting started with our first property, we just need something that's going to just tick along and grow in value. As we get experience, uh, we can look at different strategies and start to multiply. Uh, yourself, Cameron, you've got had a few properties. You've done a lot of development. Now you're looking at going into property development, but it's not something we'd recommend for the, your first investment property. You know, so that's why we have these conversations individual with each of you and just work out your strategy your price point, your time frame, and what you're looking to achieve and then make a recommendation you know, based on that individual position. Yeah? Um, we talked about cash flow. So this is a property investment analysis. So this is a really detailed uh, property report. This page that you're seeing here is the summary page. So it's a, like a five page document and it breaks all the figures down. So having the information so we know that we haven't missed any of the income and any, also any of the um, you know, costs from the property. So this is just, um, again, all the numbers and properties we're going to talk about today are generic. Um, so just use our average figures, just remember that. So just to, because once you understand these PIAs and the cash flow, when, when we start talking about specific properties, it all sort of makes sense. And this will answer that question about, is it positively geared or negatively geared? So um, let's jump on this side. So property purchase price at 650,000. Uh, and putting no money into the deal. So this is what's called 100% funding. So if you've got a current property, whether it's a property living or an investment property, this is the great thing about property. You don't, once you start building your portfolio, you don't have to have cash in the bank to buy your next property. And Kamesh will touch on that when we talk about finance. You can use your existing equity. So that's the great thing. So I think the, hard, the first one is always the hardest one to get started. Uh, you guys in the room are quite young, so that's great. You know, you've got a, a long way to go. And, Great opportunities when you get the first property right, you know. So you don't have to save up for each property; you can let that property grow in value. And for those of us that are older and we've had properties, that's the strategy we use. So the numbers are based on borrowing all the money in this case. But if it was your first investment property, we'd put a deposit in that investment straight. So using no deposit, purchase costs. So uh, when we're buying the investment property, it's very different when we buy our own home. So we have a different rate of stamp duty for investors. It is higher, but it's just a cost of doing business. So stamp duty, solicitor's cost, so that's in the purchase cost. 
If it's um, an existing home, we pay the stamp duty on the value of the property, the 650000 If it's a brand new property, house and land, for example, we only pay stamp duty on the land component, so there's a saving there. So that's why there's a, it's not one size fits all. Uh, so I'm using zero uh, cash to buy this property, uh, gross rent of 550 a week, uh, so about 27,000 gross income per year. Interest only loan, uh, so the mortgage payments per year about 22,000. Uh, rental expenses, 10,000, so that's things like apart from the mortgage, so that's rates, insurance, property management, you know, inspections, things like that, um, about 10,000 per year. Great thing about property investment in Australia, it can grow in value, uh, but the, the other thing is um, the tax office treats us as investors very generously, which is fantastic. So um, for any of those new to property investing, two types of depreciation we can claim. Depreciation on the physical building, 2.5% for the first 40 years of the property. Um, so if you bought a property that's 10 years old, you've got another 30 years of depreciation on the building. So depreciating the building, 2.5% per year over the value of the building. So it might be half of that 650K. And then we've got depreciation of the fittings. So the fittings are ceiling fans, light switches, carpets, etc. Uh, loan costs, so that's the bank valuation cost, you know, and the packages, things like that. We make sure that uh, we take care of all those costs. So your costs may be lower than that, but we always make sure we, rule well, of thumb with investing is overestimate your costs and underestimate your income. So you've got that safety net. Uh, we've got a joint income, so a couple on a joint income of 140K, so based on that property, the tax benefit per year on the first year would be about five thousand eight hundred. It's pretty fantastic, hundred hundred and ten dollars, hundred and twenty dollars a week. So including the tax return, that property is twenty two dollars a week positively geared. So I'm not saying this is the right property. This is just the example of the cash flow and how important it is to get the numbers. So twenty two year one, year two, year three, year five, and year ten. So this is a ten year forecast. So again, we're not just going out and buying a property. We're understanding the numbers and the cash flow behind it before we make. Um, that property decision. So again, this is the summary page. So we obviously, if I was looking at a property for myself or for a client, we will always run the numbers through a PIA to make sure it, it stacks up. So that's the benefit of having that experience. So again, before we purchase the property, we need to understand the cash flow because that's really critical, okay? Any questions on explaining any of the figures here? I'm happy to go through in a bit more detail. So you look like a spreadsheet, you just put yeah, it's a spreadsheet, yeah, so um, this is a property, property investment one. Um, it's very detailed. I've used a few over the years. This one is very, very good. Um, and that's a summary page, so you can say, hey, Jeff, did you allow for, you know, the, the lawnmower guy once a week or body corporate if it's got apartments? So we would have all those figures in the breakdown. But it is important to do numbers. That's what we do. Yep. Elephant in the room. <laughs> um, it's because interest rates have changed and we're not used to, see, Sean? Um, we're not used to, Interest rate rises. It is a new thing for those getting started in property investment. For those that have had investment properties for many, many years, such as Amish has, um, we're used to interest rates being much, much higher. So it's not the end of the world, but it is important to be aware of uh, what's happening in terms of interest rates. Um, and again, for media sensationalised, blows things out of proportion. When you look at the facts, 33% of all homeowners are debt free. So a third of the market of property owners aren't affected by interest rate rises, so they don't have to sell their property, right? So that's a third gone, but they're not really affected. Another third are investors. So those investors with a couple of the cash flow, we're not really gonna panic and sell our property because we know property investment is long-term. That's so only about a third of the market that's actually affected by these rate rises. So when you say, oh, rate rises, property's gonna drop by 30, 40%, not really factual because it's around about a third of the market. And if you look at recently, uh, I think uh, I mean, you should know the statistics more. There's a lot of homeowners that are hit on their mortgages. And I'll get you to. Yeah, like the investors, like I mean, they always have the respective strategies. You know, they they have to invest. So we always go with the quality cash flow property and the release of equity just as a buffer to be required. But I'll discuss more on that in one second. You know, as to like uh, depending on your requirements. Yeah, we are going to get let me shut because he's an expert. Um, so the ways we overcome these interest rate, know your numbers, very important. Finding high cash flow properties, so those are properties that are giving you more than that average income. So if the property is neutral or negatively geared, once every time the interest rate rises, it's a real pain. It does cost you. But if you can have a high cash flow property, that's giving that, that buffer or that margin. Yeah? That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, invest where rents are rising. So Sean was a great case. You know, his rent's gone up $100 a week, which is massive. 
in about 18 months. So you want to be investing in areas where there's a rental demand and there's a shortage, as many will be aware, uh, right around Australia in many areas. So you could buy a property in the middle of New South Wales or Queensland for 200,000, it could rent out every day, but it's not going to grow in value. So you want to be investing where there's you know, demand, where population is growing, rental demand, because where that population is growing, there's competition for properties, your rents will rise, which will help offset the uh, interest rate rises. Um, if anyone's looked for a rental uh, up on the Gold Coast at the moment, um, pretty much impossible to find a rental property. Um, and uh, we rented our last property out in Coomarashi, where Sean's bought two kilometres away, and it went on real estate, um, through the property manager on realestate.com um, with an open home on Friday, open home on Saturday, and it was rented out within 24 hours. Going live, didn't even get to the first open home. So, there's, you know, there's again, don't listen to the media based on facts, you know. Um, restructure your loans. Um, so, I'm going to get Kamish. I've known Kamish, I think, seven, eight years. Kamish, come up. Yeah, we've known uh, yeah, for about five, six years now. I'm Kamish. I'm a mortgage broker, broker UK in Sydney. I operate from Sherry Group. Uh, we've been working together for the last five, six years and helping the investors like you uh, to source the funds to buy the property. As Jeff said earlier, in any market, when it's the right time to buy the property, there are always an opportunity there. So we went similar, like, you know, kind of uh, sentiment in, in the GFC. The GFC, people started panicking what will happen. But again, people who bought the property with the GFC, they are now, you know, uh, Realizing the, the benefits, right? Because the property prices have gone up. There are many ways to kind of hold the property, and the end goal is to hold the property longer. The longer you hold it, the better it is. Because it's a long term game. It's not like a share market, you buy it today, sell tomorrow, it's not going to happen, right? So, and as Jeff said, that it's always good to buy between 9 and 12, but who knows? Who knows when the next 9 will come? Eh? Between 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock. We don't know. When it will come. So it's always a good time to buy. We can negotiate the interest rate with the bank. You can go for interest only loans. But the most important thing is the cash flow positive. So if you have the rental yield already, which is like a new occupancy properties, you know, generally give you, you won't be chasing up the interest rate or restructuring your loan because you already have the higher rental yield. So for giving an example, I had the, you know, Achal. So like one of my existing clients, so he contacted me in 2017 and he said that look, I wanna I've never done any investment, I would like to now start. I introduced him with Jeff and we bought the first investment property in Bethlehem. Bethlehem? Yes. So double double rent, you know, he never had to pay anything to put the, you know towards the, from his pocket. And also he received the negative hearing and you know the depreciation and everything as a tax advantage. And he hasn't stopped, right? I mean, he went with different agents down the track, but he's currently buying with the fifth fifth property in less than five years. And they're all dual occupancy properties. Wow. He just paid the deposit to the, uh, to last week uh, for dual occupancy property in Perth. So he's targeting different markets, but never had any investment property in around May 2017. Now he just paid the deposit for his fifth loan. Fantastic. Wow. And they're all dual occupancy, all highly positive gate properties. So it has with the whole loans as well because the banks can allow up to six to seven percent of the rental yield. So if you have like a high rental income already, that will help you with your finance as well with your home loan applications. But I will like discuss on one on one with you as as and when like you know you require some more assistance about the finance, and then we will like uh, take it from there. Thank you. And can you speak yeah. for you guys? Yeah. Thank you for that. Explain the the budget the banks factoring about their current life for safety. Yeah, so banks always like put, uh, uh, you know, the uh, they call the buffer or they call the assessment rate. So you may get the interest rate, let's say four percent or four and a half percent, but the banks will allow two and a half or three percent on top of you. Not only for the new loan that you're applying for, but also for your existing loans. So if you're currently paying, even if like you have locked in your interest rate for two percent for your unoccupied property, because you were one of the lucky ones last year who locked in at one point nine nine percent. And you're still paying 1.99% as of today. But the bank will add another 3% on top of it. And they will add, you know, uh, 3% and now the interest rate becomes, you know, a 4.99. So they will do the assessment on 4.99%, which is close to 5%, which is what the current rate is. 
But the new loan that you're applying for, which is a 5% already, they will put another 3% on top of it, it becomes 8%. Mm. So that's how, like the banks always need to make sure that your income, even if your income remains the same, the interest rate goes up to 3% higher. But look, that's why you deal with an independent broker like myself, because I have access to 40 different you know, lenders. So some lender may improve only 1%, some lenders may improve 2%, and some lender may say that, look, the new loan you're applying for, you will apply buffer on that only. Your current existing $3 million loan, whatever you pay, that's what you will consider. So that's that's how like you know we need to find the right strategy and uh, you based on your requirement you find the right product. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just a question. Say if you're a first time lawyer, yeah, first you're doing a subdivision, you go to do a dual offer, or whatever. Do you have your favorite banks you go with, for example? We really like NAB first time borrowers, but we really like sort of ANZ for construction, we really like the banks, no, no, to, the banks are your favorites as well pushing that direction. No, no, not like that. So based on the individual requirements, depending on you know the strategy, depending on the requirement, be very independent. So for example, someone just signed the coin finance so six months ago, but the market has gone up in the last six months and they want to release the equity, they want to take the benefit of it. They paid they signed a contract for half a million, for example, to buy a land. Now it's been six months and three days, he calls me, the person calls me and he said that now the property value is now seven hundred thousand. So I know which bank to go, That's who right. will give the new value. That's right, yeah. That's right. Yeah, but if someone has signed 12 months ago, then there are all the lenders who consider. But some, they have got like the policy, mm -hmm. okay? But some, like you need to ask for an exception, a credit exception, a policy exception. exception. But it, it is doable, like in, uh, there's no straightforward answer. I have dealt with 15 different lenders in the last 12 months. So depending on the requirement, I have access to all of them. Thank you. Any other question? I think it explains how important finance is. It's not just the property. The property is very important, but it's also relies on the finance specialist. Because that, and if your goal is to build your property portfolio, you know, Kamish can take that into account. So he's recommending the lender and the LVR and how much deposit. He can factor into that. You know, so it's a, banks are continuously evolving. The interest rate margin, yes, it reduces our borrowing capacity, but it also helps protect the Australian property market. As well, all the experts are not expecting the property market in most areas of Australia not to collect because of banks have already factored in much higher interest rates, which is you know, reduce our buying capacity you know, on the outside and help protect the market. You know. Yeah, so people who bought the property one year ago, the interest rate was 3%, but the bank have assessed them on 6%. Mm -hmm. Right, and also the living expenses, for example, bank have get their own benchmark for living expenses. Someone like Tristan, someone like George, if they're staying like you know, still staying with the family, the living expense may be lower. But the bank will also add the notional rent. So Tristan, even if you're not paying any rent, you know, to your parents, the bank will still consider six hundred and fifty dollars a month minimum, like you know, notional rent that you're paying to your parents. Yeah, yeah. So all those things play into picture, and that's why you know it's very important to know which lender to go with, so that we don't. Uh, you know, calculate those motional lands and you can still maximize your borrowing capacity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. So we talked about rental demand, vacancy rates really important. So let's happening, what's happening around Australia in terms of population and interstate migration, because this is a real game changer at the moment and it's very important. So when we look at the population growth right around Australia for the capital cities, and as you can see there, Queensland has got the highest population growth in Australia at the moment. So anyone that's been up to holiday in the last six to 12 months will see more cars on the road, more demand. As I mentioned earlier, vacancy rates are extremely low. So you've seen migration loss from Victoria, New South Wales, fairly stagnant, but Queensland's a real standout in terms of population growth. So again, if you're looking to invest, that's where you want to be investing, where the demand, where people are moving to. It's an increase of capital growth. A mutual client, he did very well in the first property and allowed him to build his portfolio because he's invested in the right area. And then he's got confidence going, invest outside that area. Queensland has amazing growth at the moment and it's going to continue to grow. And just remember we've got the Queensland's got the Olympic Games coming in 2032. So that's just another factor. You know, when Sydney had the 2000 and games for those that can remember back in the 90s the property market in Sydney really started to move up and that was a real game changer for Sydney and that's why the real experts that know the market are predicting strong things for Brisbane or Greater Brisbane region in Queensland. There's a lot of infrastructure to be built to host host the games. And that capital injection is drawing in jobs and investment into the state. Yeah, go where 
again, don't go in the middle of nowhere where there's no, property's cheap, but there's no demand. You're gonna be stuck with that property, go where people wanna be living. Vacancy rates, we talked about earlier, about 3% of a fairly tight rental market, vacancy rate market, and you can see all the capital cities right around Australia, all well under that. So again, it's great for time for property investors because those figures are extremely low. Anything under 3%, so you can see Sydney even 1.6%, but again, Brisbane 0.7% on average in Greater Brisbane, so that's less than 1%, so that means, there's a, so these are real figures. So we're not saying, oh, I think we can rent the property out. We know from these facts and figures, and when we're factoring into the cash flow, we know we're gonna get tenants for our property. So all about information today and the statistics, because that's something that you guys looking forward and remember that vacancy rates, uh, where the growth is, infrastructure, it's all, the strategies don't change over the years. That's how successful property investors have got ahead. So this is a cash flow example, a very basic one of just a house, an existing house versus one of these higher cash flow properties. Like for me, shared one of his clients, it's got multiple dual occupancy properties and I will be covering those in detail. I've built a couple myself for the reasons that we're gonna run through. So let's look at house. Purchase price, 800,000, rented at $700 per week. So the gross rental income is 33,000 per year. Older homes are tax savings, minimal tax savings, 2,000 a year approximately. So our total income is 35,600. And then we've got a loan, 800,000, three and a half percent roughly, 28,000 in mortgage payments, and about 8,000 in property expenses. So our income is 35,600, and our gains are 36,000. So there's a negative cash flow situation. Okay, so that property is costing us money to hold that property per week. Okay, then we look at the dual income property. Okay, so the dual income property, same purchase price, but now we've got more rent because we've got two property, two tenants, but we'll explain this in a bit more detail how these dual occupancies work. So now we've got a higher rental income, we've got better tax savings, so it's a brand new maintenance free type property. And then comparing, so higher gross income, it's not the it's a net figure that counts, remember. So we've got the same mortgage payments, slightly more property expenses because we do have two tenants in place. Yearly outgoings thirty seven thousand, so cash flow positive about thirteen thousand per year. Fantastic. Depending on the property, property somewhere between two to two hundred and fifty per week. So that's massive. So that's what we call positive cash flow. So even if interest rates go up in a half percent, one percent, which they are at the moment, you still got that margin, and so they make that's a game changer when you're looking at building your property portfolio and not having to sell, even if the property's not growing in value, that positive cash flow is going to allow you to hold it. And as Clemish said earlier, when you come back to re refinancing your property, the banks take this income into account. So it's going to help you, whether it's your first property, your investment, first investment property or your second, positive cash flow is going to help your borrowing capacity. And because the banks have really tightened up in the last few years, borrowing capacity is really important, especially when you're on a modest income. So when you asked about that software we're going to use. So this is an example of how we can use that income. So if anyone's got an existing mortgage and they want to pay that loan off faster of their own home, this is how we're going to do it. Okay, so this is an example of a dual occupied property in a bit more detail. So it's like a case study, about $211 a week, positively geared. Fantastic, okay. Based on the purchase price, $800,000, about $800 a week. So the actual numbers, are, this is taken into account the more accurate property expenses, okay? So that's gonna vary depending on the property, the location, but this is a pretty typical figures for a dual occupancy property, which is fantastic. So you've got a tenant in place and the tax savings are actually paying that asset off for you. So about 211 a week. So let's say we had a own a home in Australia, and this is just a case study, an example, okay? Say a home was worth a million dollars, and we had a loan of 600,000. For those new to investing, we always talk about the equity, so the equity position. So at the moment, our property's worth a million, a loan 600,000, so our equity is 400,000. On a mortgage payment of about 2,846 per month, that property is gonna take us about 25 years to pay off that loan. Okay, so that's fairly sort of average figures, okay? And please stop me and ask me if you want me to clarify or got any questions, just put your hand up to explain. So. Got the home with one million, we owe 600,000, we've got 400,000 equity in the property, and our net worth today is 400,000. If we sold the property, we'd have 400,000, essentially in the bank, without selling costs, of course, but just keeping it as simple figures. 400,000 net equity. So let's add in the rental income from that dual occupancy property. So we've now we've got a cash flow positive property. So we've got that 
$211 a week. Let's say we can add an extra $900 a month to our mortgage payment. So we're using the cash flow from the dual occupancy property into our home loan. So now, can you see the term remaining on the loan? So we've taken it down from 25 years down to seven years. Fantastic. So we've paid the home loan off seven years faster. And we haven't had to put any extra money into it to reduce the rental income. So you can see that it all starts to make sense and the power if you get it right. So we've paid the loan off 17 in 17 years, so seven years faster. And I calculated the, the interest savings on that as well. And the other great thing is we've taken our net worth. So our net worth today is 400K, so that's in our current owner occupier property. Now, if we go ahead and use that equity to buy the high cash flow property, add the income in, now we've got two properties growing in value like Pramesh's client did with the five properties in five years. In 10 years time, so that's year one, year two, year three, year five, year 10, we've got our net worth of 2.8 million. Fantastic. Imagine trying to save that, you know. So it's paying a mortgage off and then using the investment and rental income to add into our home loan. So that's the real goal for investment properties. Now, so we're actually talking about specific properties and we're going to go a bit more detail into property itself and cash flow. As many will be aware, I'm a buyer's agent, so I operate in southeast Queensland. So I can source property from northern New South Wales right through to Gold Coast, Brisbane, Sunshine Coast. And that's, as we talked about earlier in the first part, that's where the real demand is, vacancy rates, price growth. We haven't seen the growth in that part of the world that you've seen in Sydney. So it's still affordable and still profits to be made. Our property market's still going up because we've only probably had about two, two and a half years of growth where our market started to change. So this is just going to give you some ideas of properties, some figures. If you'd like to look at these properties in more detail, we have booklets on the properties. So these are properties available on the market. And this will give you a good understanding of the figures around specific properties. So this is a brand new property, four bedroom home, fairly typical, so double garage, four bedrooms with an ensuite, two bathrooms. So this is the type of property, if it was your first investment property, it's affordable, it's going to rent, it's not going to have any issues with older properties. I've had new properties, I've had older properties, I've renovated, built new. Recently I've gone down the path of new properties, just to suit my, obviously with my role in the business, and I just want the properties to tick along, so these types of properties tick along very well. And as we talked about Clemisha's client buying the first one and then using that growth, and he just kept building his portfolio in an amazing short amount of time. That's an amazing story. So brand new property, so 625754 So that's, they call it a house and land package. So you buy the land and then you build the property. So it's, but it's a fixed price contract. So that's a total purchase price. So for anyone in New South Wales, that's pretty affordable for a brand new home. So, sorry, so that's 625 is both house and land. Correct, yep, built. And it's a turnkey fixed price, which is fantastic. So... So, oh, just a, yeah, yeah, and that's right, and that's why Queensland is in so much demand at the moment because it's still affordable for a first time buyer, for an investor, you can still get into the market. So, I've done a few different price points and properties. So, this was a like an entry level one, and if your buying capacity is around that figure, it would work really well. So, rent 510, I've been fairly conservative, and look at the vacancy rate in that suburb of Bundamba 0.5 percent, which is amazingly low, under one percent. Something like this, just a quick example. So this one is five and four big rental income, which is about twenty five thousand dollars roughly a year. And what the banks look at it like whatever you're looking at the loan, okay, they can you divide it by six and that's how much they will charge you. That's really low, I guess. Oh, that's a great if your rent is giving you twenty five thousand already, so you basically and like you have some deposit out of fifty. Even if you borrow in just five fifty, you need only ninety four. So twenty five thousand out of it. So if you're living with your parents and you find a bank which don't consider the emotional rent which I was talking about, then we can do the loan. <laughs> so that's where that reinvesting strategy we talked about earlier, like you're trying to buy in Shell Harbor. So by the time you build a house and land, it's probably a million dollars if that's the land price. So you're building here and you can just let that rent out and then when the property grows in value, go and see commission about refinancing to so even if you're someone with the so what would the calculation be? Because that's a great way of explaining it to keep it fairly simple. But it's very, very basic so what would be the buying capacity on that figure if the someone was an income of say seventy thousand as an example? What's 
T naught by that by six. So like a four hundred and twenty thousand, seventy thousand times by six. So that's four hundred and twenty thousand plus that twenty five thousand. Okay, so it gets you up to five hundred. Some banks can go up to eight, up to nine. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So obviously, if you're serious about high the income, so that's why. You speak to a, a lot of my generation, we had two jobs and working six, seven days a week to get started. And so that's why we don't want to, and Tamisha will tell you, get advice from him what to do. Your credit file is very important, very important, and don't have all the afterpays and things and try and curb the spending And because the banks will look at all that history. One day, can we show you? Yeah, so some of the information may not be on your credit file. For example, after pay, now pay fell now. Even if you buy a $4 pizza, I give you an option. Do you want to pay $1 every month for the next four months? Yeah. And that's because of liability. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you don't, you have to pay, that's your loan. Bank will consider everything. Yeah, spending habits. Spending habits. Yeah. And one, one thing I do see with uh, a lot of first, I work with first time buyers getting property like this, is the biggest thing that limits them is car loans. Because it's not the amount of debt, but it's the monthly repayment. Say if you buy a brand new four wheel drive, it's $800 a month. That reduces your borrowing capacity. So you might qualify, but that car loan over the next seven years might only be forty, fifty thousand dollars but it's the monthly repayment that restricts. For the bank, like even if you can't make the repayment for one month, yeah. that means you can't afford. So you some you might have eight hundred dollars a month car loan repayment and you got only sixteen hundred to go, like only two more repayments and then you're done with that. But you can't borrow now because they come after two months. Or just pay it off now and then you can do the loan straight away. Yeah, so try and if you're buying a new car, just remember that I want to get property that's gonna gonna buy a secondhand car or a cheaper version because it's this is gonna make you money. The car is gonna devalue. It's, yeah, so it's all about successful investors and property and shares and super. It's investing your money to make money, not you know, good debt, bad debt. So for you young guys, there's a really good book book by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Have you guys you got it? So it's, yeah, it's just fantastic and it's very simple rules. But if everyone lives by those, you know. It, if you apply for a car loan, it's not that difficult. Car loan, like the calculation, is not simple. I mean, yeah. you can afford it. So do the home loan first, then you do the car loan. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> Just put off your plan for next two months and then do the car loan. Yeah. 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 So it's a change in society now. I wish they taught us at school, the education, what Grace is saying, and teaching the young people for when you get into jobs, this is why you can't buy the latest Commodore or Mustang or overseas holiday in Bali every year because this will give you wealth creation. So yeah, thank you for that input. <laughs> okay. So we look at the cash flow on this. So this cash flow is based on that property. We just talked about the figures. So purchasing the property for 625,000. So zero deposit. So if you guys had a cash deposit, if you don't own a home, it would change the figures slightly. So it'd be less debt, but this is borrowing the 100%. And just remember, there is other ways with if you don't have the cash savings. So if your parent or sibling's got a home and you speak to Kamesh because there's ways you can use the equity in their properties if they're willing to help you. So I think as a parent myself, help my daughter and my, grand, my son and grandkids into a house and it changed their life, the way they look at things. They've been moving, renting for 15 years and moving around and changing the schools. Got their own home now, it's like the car, so they're really settled. Massive game changer. If a parent can help you or a sibling can help you or you're going together, I think that's another great strategy. So my brothers, sisters or mates and pull your resources because you've got joint year incomes. I've done it before with a joint with a mate, so just to get back on the ladder. So zero deposit, 510 a week, interest only loan, rental expenses, seven, six per year, taxable income. So again, if you're on a single income, we'd calculate based on your actual position, but based on that combined income, that property is $92 a week positively geared, which is fantastic. You're buying all the money and it's not costing you to own that property. Does this all make sense? Yeah. So if it's your first investment property, it works, that reinvesting strategy could work really well on something like that. And then you can use that growth in that property to fund the equity if you want to buy your own home. So if you get a partner and have kids and think and later life, that you've always got that option when you've got an asset growing. So this is just a bit about the location. So this is uh, in under the uh, LGA of Ipswich. So um, this is a pretty good indication. So it's near. So you, we talked earlier about going close to infrastructure, public transport, education. If it's a house, we're probably going to be renting it to families. So we want to be areas where there's transport corridor and infrastructure going in. Two kilometres to the cross coast. The cross coast, be aware of huge retail outlet. Two train stations, very close. Race club, schools, education, very important. TAFE at Ipswich, and within 10 kilometres, grammar schools, Ipswich hospitals. So these are key infrastructure. 
that has a, a multitude of employment. So doctors, nurses, cleaners, my staff, etc. have to work there and they have to live somewhere and rent that property. So you want to be investing, again, not in the middle of nowhere, but where there's rental demand. University of Southern Queensland there as well, Ipswich Road, I station with Nick so quite close to all the infrastructure. So that's the estate. This is already under construction. I was out there, I've got a first home buyer building your own home in that area and there's probably about 25 homes already completed there and that's all the infrastructure quite close. You can see it's an area that's got everything already in and about our CBD of Brisbane, 35 minutes. So you know, still well within commutable distance. So if you buy close to Brisbane, it might cost you eight or 900,000 for property. This way you're still getting in in the sixes. And that's the location and that's Brisbane up there. So the 35 minutes that we talked about, depending on the traffic, 40 minutes there. So close to the infrastructure around Ipswich and then you go back into towards Brisbane, lots of universities and highways, etc. I built a draw up property in Chura, so I know that area quite well, so it's really growing and it's still affordable for first home buyers and investors still getting good return. Yeah. They do work really well. So that so that look for a traditional house from the street front, so you're driving down into a suburb and they look like a standard home. So they're really a larger dwelling on one side with an auxiliary dwelling or a granny flat type. Okay. So looking from the road frontage, there's a larger residence on one side and a smaller residence on the other side. So that's how we get them through council. They are different to a duplex. So we can source houses, units, townhomes, high occupancy properties. These really provide very good cash flow. So you might have a three or four bedroom residence on one side, the main residence, and then on the other side, you might have a one or two bedroom unit. So you've got a combination. So the more cost effective to build in duplexes, there's less council infrastructure charges. So the rental return or yield is stronger. We talked about earlier about strategy. So if your strategy was sell the property, turn it over fairly quickly, then we'd recommend a duplex pair. If the strategy was to buy and hold this property for long term for income, which allows you to buy the next property sooner, as Comesha's client did, these are the properties that work very well. So this is a floor plan. So they, this one's got the larger residence on the left hand side. So really nice dwelling, three bedroom with an ensuite, so two bathrooms, combined living kitchen, dining room, and outdoor El Fresco area. Okay. And between the properties, they have a fireproof, soundproof wall. So double skinned, double frame, double skin. And then on the other side of the dwelling, it's like a granny flat auxiliary dwelling. So you might have a one or two bedroom, in this case, two bedroom property. So looking from the street view, the main entrance is here. And then the one or two bedroom would be here. So there's a gate. Oh, it's got a gate there. So the residents for the second unit walk down the side through the gate. This is obviously a mirror image, walk down and into the two bedroom. So perfect for a single person that might have family stay over or a single parent with a child that needs affordable accommodation. I've got one of these on the Gold Coast and it's never been vacant. So I think the first, in fact, I remember when I first built it, the first open home through the property manager, there was 14 applicants for the three bedroom and 12 for the two bedroom. So very strong rental income. So really nice appointed, the purpose built for investment. So brand new, everything's well laid out, so people really like them for convenience. And the good thing is they're not sharing anything. It's just dividing wall and they have their own alfresco. And if you imagine that's the back of the block, they'd have a wall in you know, a fence going to the back of the property. So if they've got small pets or small children, they've got their independent outdoor living as well, which is very important. They have their own power meters and own water. So you, the property manager, it's easy for them to manage. They can rent them out to two separate tenants. So they don't have to be shared. So they work very well. That's the figures on the property. So that's a property that's available. It's in Logan Reserve. I will go through the location. Eight hundred thousand. I'm just going. Eight hundred thousand rents for eight hundred dollars a week. So fantastic rental return. And that's I've got a when I'm looking at properties, I always get a rental appraisal from the property manager on this property appraised at eight thirty. So I've used conservative eight hundred per week for that safety fact. Vacancy rate in Logan Reserve one point three six percent. So hugely low. But we know. What would a typical split, so 800 is probably, I'm assuming the, the smaller application would be less for the larger. What would a typical split be? Yeah, good question. So in this case, it'll be about, probably about 500 for the three bedroom and then about 300 for the two bedroom. But we actually got a rental. So when I find a property for a client, it actually has a rental appraisal letter in the booklet. So it, it splits up the two, yeah. As I mentioned, I've built a couple myself and many of my clients have done them over the years. They, can, they can't be built everywhere, so certain councils allow them, certain don't, but they're a very good concept if your focus is 
on cash flow and building your property portfolio. So that's the cash flow on this property. So eight hundred thousand, eight hundred dollars per week, and we're factored in these cash flows three percent vacancy rate. So I've allowed for that vacancy rate, and then twenty seven thousand mortgage payments, nine thousand in rental expenses. So this is a bit obviously higher rental expenses than a standard home, but much higher rental income. Same tax taxable income, and that property's gone from I think the other one was ninety three to two hundred and four a week. So you can see the massive difference. So when Kamisha's calculating your buying capacity, that's a big positive. And you can rent them out to one family. So if you've got parents with elderly parents or teenage children, it can be rented out to one family if that was your choice. Or some people build them in with the intention of if they want to move to Brisbane, they can live on one side and rent the other out. So if your intention was to do that long term, it's a great, you've always got accommodation. If that was your strategy long term. But year one, year two, three, year five, year 10. So you can see it's pretty consistent income. Okay, so in all these forecasts, we're factored in capital growth and inflation as well. So it's not an exact science, but it's as close as you'll get. So it's better to have an approximate idea. No one's got the crystal ball, but it's rather than just buy it and hope for the best. We actually know pretty accurately capital growth over the last 50 years and inflation. We can forecast that as accurately as, as possible. So we've got a pretty good idea. So we know based on those numbers, the property's going to pay for itself. Okay, so that's uh, the property. So the estate, again, this is all pretty much developed now, but Again, infrastructure, lots of schools, private and public as well, the college, Griffith University, so the university's over there. So this is the estate hospital, so Logan Hospital with train station right underneath it, shopping centre across the road, 47 k's to Brisbane Airport, 35 k's to Brisbane CBD, 63 k's to the Gold Coast. So that's under the Logan LGA. The Logan and Ipswich LGA allow dual occupancies, but a lot of the other parts of Greater Brisbane don't, so we've got to be very specific. We can't just buy a block of land and build these. They have to be council approved. So that's why they are quite rare now. Investors love them, but they are getting quite hard to source because a block of land has to be a certain size and also has to be zoned for dual occupancy as well. So the council won't allow streets and streets of them. But you can see that, getting back to the theory, good location, close to infrastructure. So again, we talked about that. Criteria being close to infrastructure and jobs, very important. So there's demand for your rental property. Logan Transport Corridor, got main access. So you've got the Logan motorway that goes out to Ipswich, Toowoomba, and then out to the mining town. So there's a, quite a lot of big factories there. So there's lots of employment, middle class working suburb. Logan Hospital, 2,000 employees, gone through an up, expansion upgrade. A second private hospital, Poe. The Yatler Industrial Hub, so anyone that's been up to the Gold Coast between Brisbane and the Gold Coast is an area called Yatla. It's all industrial, massive. There's huge factories up there. And those people, those factories have to employ staff. And those staff have to rent somewhere. They don't own their property, buy or rent. So there's lots of demand for your tenants. That's a key thing. Holding your investment property for the long term and having that rental demand. We're an industrial precinct. And a project's been in the pipeline for a number of years that is now under construction as a Crestmead industrial park, a logistics centre, 650,000 square metres of warehousing, going to generate over 6,000 full-time jobs. And that's already under construction, so I think it's at stage one, the factory's already built, but it's going to be over the next five to seven years of development. So lots of employment. You can see it's already pretty much developed around the area, so we're running out of land in Queensland now. So that's the key, supply, and that's the reason why Brisbane hasn't seen the growth that Melbourne and Sydney have seen. We had land supply. The last sort of five years, that land supply has been greatly eaten up Government grants with COVID, first home buyers have really got into the property market and a lot of that green space the land that was available is now built on and with this population growth that's why that supply is very short for rental and that's why property prices now we're starting to see that capital growth, you know. So you're still getting in at the, we talked about the property clock, getting in at the ideally the six to nine o'clock stage. This is an area that's going through that change, you know. So it's the location, that's the main highway going from the Gold Coast down here up to Brisbane, it's 40 minutes to Brisbane. It's probably depending on the part of the Gold Coast, probably about 35, 40 minutes to Surface Paradise as well. Logan's quite central between, so you've got three LGAs. Another important factor with the Logan and then Ipswich, the other property was out here. Within this corridor, you've got the Logan LGA Council, you've got the Brisbane LGA, and you've got the Gold Coast. So you're right in that triangle, so you've got like, all large councils. This is a fairly recent concept, which for those that have a, a reasonable buying capacity and really want to maximise the cash flow, and these have really been brought about for the demand for single level, single P 
people rental accommodation shortage. If you Google on the news accommodation on the Gold Coast, people living in cars, very sad actually, caravan parks, people sleeping on couches, families getting moved out of properties because of the rents. Like Sean's property, you know, it went up $100 a week. My investment property from last four years has probably increased about $250 a week in income from four years ago. We can't control that, but it's very sad. So people that are on low incomes are really struggling for accommodation. So these types of accommodation are designed to give you that. So we talk about pros and cons of every, any decision that we make, and property's no different. Every property has pros and cons, and you just wake up, work out what's best for yourselves. But there is some real benefit for this. So it's some, it is a traditional four-bedroom house, four-bedroom, two living areas. But the difference with this property is it's built with en-suites in each bedroom. So bedroom, en-suite, bedroom, en-suite. So the benefit of this is you can actually rent the rooms out individually. So you could put key locks, electronic locks on each bedroom. So you could rent it out to a family, mum and dad and teenage children, or you could rent it out per room. So the property manager would rent the rental income out per room, and that's going to dramatically increase your rental return. So again, it's that higher cash flow. So we talked about interest rates rising and cash flows reduced. These are ways of overcoming that. The good thing about this is it looks like it is a traditional home, built like a traditional home, a bit more cost than adding the bathrooms in at construction, but the rental income over the next 10, 15, 20 years is massive. Yeah. That's, not, that's not a living house, is it? It's, yeah, so they call this co-living. So this is where you share all your common living areas. So you've still got a media room, so you've got two lounges. So you can put a good size room, so you can put a student desk in there. So there might be single people that have gone through a marital breakup and on their own they can't afford to rent a three or four bedroom house or unit. Young people just getting started with one income and they don't want to be in a massive student accommodation. These work really well. And the good thing about these is when you sell them for capital growth, these would sell very well because you're selling them as a four bedroom home with three or four bedroom home, in this case three bedrooms, with three bathrooms. So it's, you can sell it to another family, whereas the jewel locks would be sold more than likely to another investor. So that's why we talk about strategies and those individual conversations. And these are still affordable. And the other benefit with these is they're not restricted to the council. So you can build them in the Gold Coast, Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, areas like that. Sorry to interrupt you, actually, do you explain that? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, exactly. We'll finish this property. Good point, Cameron, because it's another concept. So four, three or four bedrooms and en suites in each room and can be sold as a traditional house. It's the price point seven forty five, still very affordable. Rental income seven fifty, eight hundred a week. So very similar cash flow to the dual occupancy. Vacancy rate in the suburb, which is Logan Reserve, one point three six percent. So another project we're actually at last weekend. So these are apartments. So I think these would work if your idea is to buy a, a holiday property or you're moving around and you were coming to the Gold Coast, so if you're a regular to the Gold Coast for a holiday, you might have a family come up here or a single person and love the Gold Coast where you can own the apartment, very strong cash flow, and then you can rent the apartment out the rest of the year. So you might use it for five weeks of the year and then you rent the apartment out the rest of the year with temporary short-term accommodation. So the Gold Coast is going through massive growth at the moment, huge demand for rental property. Apartments, I would generally not always recommend. This development is a little bit differently. It's, it sets the standard in terms of finish, quality, and price point. So this developer is self-funded, Italian uh, developer, and he bought the land 18 years ago. So what he means is he's paid the land price 18 years ago. So when he's selling these apartments, very cost-effective. So you're getting a much better return because he doesn't have to buy the land two or three years ago when the land's tripled in price. So the value for money in these is actually very strong. So if anyone had the idea and didn't have the buying capacity of eight or 900000 or had the idea of they want a, a property, I would say the, the capital growth is not going to be as strong, but the cash flow is going to be strong. So we talked about strategies and lifestyle. If you've got a few properties and you're up coming to the Gold Coast and accommodation has really gone up in price, if anyone that's stayed up there recently, they could really work really well. So this is going to be quite a stunning development. Stage one is going to be this 15-level building here which is currently for sale, range of one to three bedroom apartments, rooftop pools, gym, entertaining room, stunning. And tower two, the next stage is going to be the largest residential tower in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's going to be 107 levels. Yeah. So anyone that's familiar with Q1 was largest in the Southern Q Q1 in the Gold Coast, the Q1 tower. Q1 and 77 floors, and I know because I run up it, this one's 107 levels. We, uh, when we went last week and they took us into a um, apartment block, 
next door to where this has been constructed and built like about the same level as this hotel here and the view is amazing. You could see out to the Himalayan, you could see out to out to the marina and the water. So whatever side you're on, you just want to view. And one thing they did recommend to us, because it's going to be long before the two larger towers are complete, you could start in this one, get some equity in it, and then when the other two are finished, then you could upgrade and move to the next one. Because like the small one would have grown in value by the time the others are complete. So you've still got somewhere there to go. You want to go out up to Gold Coast for a holiday, you've got accommodation, best for you just check it out. So they have an on-site manager that will take care of all that temporary accommodation. And at the moment there's a real demand for that. The one bedrooms and um, the good size are 57 square meters on average, so they're a proper one bedroom. So they're not a studio apartment; they're actually one bedroom, separate living area. With a, and they all have balconies, which I really like. So a lot of apartments don't have balconies, and I think you really need that outdoor entertaining area. And it also wants to stand out, be a, like a, a standard above everything else. So we're starting out from about the mid fives, which is about 550 for one bedroom, which is actually really good value. And the quality, the developer is Italian, and he's done really nice finishes. So 40 mil stone bench tops, waterfall ends. Italian appliances, like it's, I see a lot of apartment developments around, but that standard of this the finish is going to be great. And the price point, I think, is really good. Two bedrooms from about 650, two bedroom, two bathroom. We've got a couple of books as well. We've done quite some of them last week. Do you want So that's the location, so that's Imperial Square. So the developer owns the land here, there's existing shops on it. He's got his own real estate here, and he's already got the machinery on the site starting to dig the foundations. And we actually went to a building next door, Lisa said, that was up, I don't know what level that was, 10 or 11, and great view. So you could, the apartment will run this way, so you can buy on the western side for the hinterland views, because the Gold Coast, there's beaches one side, and then you've got mountains the other side, so really nice view or you buy on the eastern side for the water views. So there's the broad water quite close to the water. There's the hospital. So there's the university and the hospital next to each other. Test is so one of the most expensive private schools in Queensland, the Southport School. So that's where the apartments are really close. Ferry Road, markets down here. So yeah, quite an exclusive sort of area. And as I mentioned, it's going to be the Southport is the Gold Coast CBD. Yeah, rooming. So you had a question, uh, Cameron? Yeah, so we talk about cash flow properties and our options. You mentioned rooming accommodation, Cameron. So this is a little bit different, again, driven by the demand for that small accommodation because there's a shortage. A lot of people, the old family demographics of mum and dad and the two children, it's really changing world now. 
have gone through separations and some people never get married or have a partner and they still need somewhere safe and secure to live. So this is brought about because a lot of single women don't have, can't afford rental accommodation and there's a severe need for that. So this is rooming accommodation, a, bit, a little bit about the co-living, but it does differ. So the each, so this is a design, a two-story design, five bedroom unit, and each unit has its own bedroom. Okay, no, all good. Okay, thank you. We've we'll been touched. So each room has its own bedroom, bathroom, little kitchenette area. So if people just want to be secure and coming on their own and don't want to mix with anyone, they can. The key lock, they're all securely locked, and the push button electronic locks on each room and your own bathroom and they've got a communal living area so if you've got friends over or you want to socialize you're welcome to socialize around the larger kitchen traditional kitchen area kitchen dining area and cook meals together but if you want your own private space you can go to your own room lock yourself in and it's got a little kitchenette like a studio apartment but it's got a separate bedroom so it's got a little we've, we've got a video actually if you're interested we can send you the video we did a walkthrough and the cash flow is very strong and you can build these anywhere we can get land but the price point because they are five bedroom like a units five individual units all under one roof line so depending on what the land price is they were around that 900 to a million now they're probably at one to 1.4 to build them the land and the build yeah but um incomes around that ninety thousand per year so really good cash flow and very strong and we can build them in Brisbane what we'd recommend for that type of property that you build them close to public transport because most, some single people might not have cars so we can't build them further out like those other properties we'd build them close into the or recommend that build them within a communal distance of the city but yeah we've got a video on that Cameron or can we see if you've got any clients that after that high cash flow it's filling your concept we've got the floor plans and the designs we can email that to you so I hope that's educated everyone today and you've got some value out of the information and a bit about property, getting started, whether it's your first investment property or your fifth, we can always learn something. And again, talking about that first property, getting that cash flow and numbers is really important. And listening to people for you, young people getting that have done it before and getting guidance from that and taking advice and thinking the big picture, my goal is property investment. I've got to make some sacrifices. I know we've all properties, we've had to make sacrifices to get into the property market. But when you see that property growing in value and you think couldn't actually save like Sean that we had on earlier to make that capital growth, it's very hard to save that 50, 100 grand. And Sydney, as Kamish would tell you, people have made hundreds of thousands of dollars in a very short space of time. So it's just, I think the most important thing is to get into it and look at it a long term. It's not a quick term money making venture. Property investment is in for the long term and just have it be patient. It might go up next year, it may not, but the long term, we said earlier, look at the long term goals. GFC properties didn't go anywhere. Some people still bought. And they look back now, fantastic. Other people are oh, not sure and listen to the media and that negative feedback and sat on the fence. It's all about making that decision. So if we help clients, first time whether it's the first property, whether it's rent vesting, as I mentioned, great strategy. So what we do now is if you'd like to discuss further, we book one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations or we have a bit of a chat about your financial position. If you're getting started, speak to me about getting your finances because even if you're not ready to go today, it might be 12 months, 18 months. But look at what you can do today, look at what you need to do to get to that first property and then be guided and just check in and make sure, like Kamish said earlier about your credit rating and files and debts on car loans and other debts will really restrict and look to invest where those, with itself, third or fourth investment property, look again, those go back to those fundamentals of cash flow and location. So we're based up in southeast Queensland, I invest there myself. For those new to property investing, property managers, we didn't talk about really important. Good property manager protects your asset. So they were a really important part. So we want the property to be well managed. So I've got contacts with good property managers up in Queensland. If you need help with that, a good property manager, don't go with the cheapest one. Go with someone that's been recommended because they're really protecting your asset. And a good property manager, I know we've had investment property over many years, a good property manager can save you a lot of headaches. A not so good one can cause you a lot of headaches. Having that team of, around you, so a good finance person, good property specialist that understands the market, a good property manager, solicitors, really important for checking all the legal things. But once you've learned all that the first property, then building that portfolio, you've got the confidence. I know the finance person, this is how it works. I know the property manager, what they do and their role in the procedure. And it can be, you get it right, it can be quite a seamless process. So you can still go to work and earn your income or travel, whatever your goals are, and that property is just set and forget if it's set up inside the right type of property in the right location. So we do Zoom calls, we're in Queensland, but 
we can go through when you're ready to invest Google Maps and all the online platforms that we've got, the technology we've got, so you can show where the property is, what the current vacancy rate is, what the cash flow is based on your financial position, because we're all different, and the right type of property. You mentioned about going to look at those tomorrow. Oh, so those apartments, they're actually down in Sydney tomorrow doing an open for inspection, a presentation. So if anyone's keen, talk to me or Lisa, because we can go and meet you there. So if you've got a, they'll actually go through the full presentation numbers so if anyone's got any interest in those. We do it last week and we both very impressed on it. So it's something you can sit around and just flip your thumb and have a go at tomorrow to find out a little bit more. Yeah, that 15 level tower, that's about 95% sold out. There's only a few left on that, which is great. So it's the fact that it's sold out. It's the fact that we've seen the developer, met with them and seeing they're not talking about doing something, they've actually got machinery on the ground already developing the site. So there's not going to be a hold up. So I think that price point, those mid fives to high fives is very good value when you look at the location. Sure. Jeff helped me build a property. I've been into the buying house almost 12 months. It's my second property I've built. The first one I did where I was very young and I was very green and I had no idea what I was doing and it was a complete disaster. And when I started working with Jeff, I said, I'm never building it again. It was so stressful. And he proved me wrong. He did it. And what I'd recommend to people, especially if you're just starting out, know your numbers first, know your borrowing capacity so you know what you can do. Because the Brisbane Gold Coast property might be so hot, things go like that. And we waited for quite a while to find the perfect block of land. Um, Jeff knew exactly what we wanted, he knew our figures. He ran like we thought we ne- it's never going to happen. It's, it, we're never going to get our property on the Gold Coast. And Jeff just ran like one week and he's got access to blocks and map all over. Sometimes he'll find out before it goes back to market. And he just ran and said, had a block of pink marks falling over, it's in your budget, it's exactly what you want. I trusted him from you, he already knew exactly what I wanted. I'm like, fine, great. I hadn't even seen it yet. I said, lock it in, we'll take it. And we were at my husband and I were at his house that afternoon signing the deal, I had to get it off the market. So when you're ready to go, make the decision quick because it just putting a bit of pressure on it's not because he's trying to sell the house, he knows that we've got it quick. With Jeff can get a call and say, oh, we've got a property available, and by the time he's around the sub, I'm and the clients go, oh, I've got to talk to my wife, I've got to go home, finish work, think about it, it's gone. So do your research first, know the area you want, know the amount you want to spend so that when something does come up, you can make an informed decision because it's a lot of money. So it, it is a lot of pressure, especially if it's your first time, but if you've got that knowledge behind you, you've got someone like Jeff that can guide you to say, yes, this is something I'm, I would invest in or I would in, or I wouldn't, don't touch it. It just makes the process so much easier. And having a team... So if you haven't got a team with a solicitor, a, um, a, a mortgage broker, or all the other people you need, Jeff has contact with people he's used before. Always use someone that's recommended. Just don't go and do, don't use Dr. Google and find someone. Go with someone that's recommended because like, there are dodgy ones out there as well. So that would be my advice if I was doing it again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Paul. And construction is a good thing because there's a lot of, you read a lot in the media about construction, don't build, and builders going bust and all that. We've got clients under construction at the moment. It's all going fine. It's taking a bit longer, but uh, I've got first-time buyers. I've got one handed over last week in Coomera, which was near where Sean bought the property and just finished, just handed over. Took a little bit longer than we thought, but got there in the end. He's already made minimum 100K equity. Just moved into the property. How good is that? So you read a lot about construction and the reality is probably 98% of builders and developers are still going ahead. It's that 2% that the media talks about. But it is important, don't just go with the cheapest builder or one that you've seen online, just really do due diligence and research because a lot of builders are still constructing, still getting materials, still going through the process. Don't be put off by construction, but make sure who you're working with is aware of that in contracts and in timeframes. And just bear in mind with property, sometimes things do get delayed. We've commissioned myself, been working together for many years. We've got clients that have the process been held up, but we're on the phone every week. We're still working to make sure that it's going to happen. It's going to get there, it might just take a bit longer. So, again, with construction, just do your research. But it's, it is, can be a great way to go, and I've done it myself many times. So, again, speak to people, work with people that have been through the processes. Borrowing by foreclosure, I'm sure you have to or your real thoughts on, say, the property capacity of tax to borrow the buy house for that full amount or take a bit safer and go maybe a little bit below the property tax? I think Kamesh could answer that question. Could you tell me depends on what future plans are? For example, if you're planning to study or change the career, it's always good to go to the maximum capacity now because you know that if you have the full buyers after that, you buy a second home. 
this too. But if you, if you know that like you need to buy the second one, and just do it. Uh, it's based on it. But again, sometimes you may not have a story because the new area like you said, but like, you don't want to change the server, but by unit, you need to set up a house, and yeah. so you don't want to change the server, but by unit, you need to set up a house just to save the 100,000. You don't want to buy, you don't want to buy, that's not for you. You don't want to buy. So it all depends on yeah, the personal report of the perspective. Yeah, so I think that individual advice mm -hmm. at the time, yeah. and like first time buyers, some people say, oh, you have to have a 20% deposit. But trying to save up a 20% deposit is 100 grand or 150 grand is massive. But if you borrow 95%, sure, you pay lend what they call lender's mortgage insurance. But you've got into the market two, three, five years before the other person that saved up the 20%. So it's a case by case strategy. You want to access your balance within a different house. So you can't do that. You want to put an interest rate on that. Some lenders used to only put the occupied. But even if you want to buy investment property, you can actually like, put it in the balance house to buy that investment property if you don't have a deposit. Yeah. Okay. And again, looking at doing something co I bought property with a mate before we both wanted to build up portfolios, we didn't have capacity individually. And then if we use. Thanks for coming, it's great. Talk to you on the last yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. So yeah, just always look at ways of, you know, if you can't afford to do it on your own, there's your other ways. Sibling, mates, may not work, but it's better to get on the ladder and wait 10 years if you're going to try and do it on your own, especially if the market's growing. You can set up like a two separate loans uh, so that your parents' equity, like equity in your parents' house is only going to be used for 10 years. So you can have like a shorter term, smaller loan, in which you like taxes will be for the family to pay it off first and free of the, the equity your parents' house, and then you just focus on your own way because it will be ten years time. So that can also be done. Sometimes the parents may they may want to give access to the equity in the family home, but it could be for shorter time, for five to ten years, because they're planning to retire, and they don't want to like to continue to like have like a mortgage on the property. So you can propose that let's do the five years or ten years, and it may work out. Yeah. So that's probably if you're considering using a family member, get the finance specialist to speak to your parents or siblings about how it all works so they can almost can explain exactly how it works. To, so they've got security, so they know it's safe and so there will be guarantors, you know. Like a security guarantor or something like that. All good? Any other questions? No? Good. <laughs> yeah, and our feedback from you guys and what you and the information that we provided today was it helpful and did you yeah. Yeah. awesome yeah, but here's the thing from like the criteria I don't even know that those dual property uh, houses were around but have a potential um, so even talking about that and that's where investment you, you're buying your own home you just look at the local suburbs but the investment property might be the best property up the road, but it might be in a different city or a different state even. That's why a lot of commissioners and most of his clients are living here, but investing in the Queensland. Yeah. Uh, where... I don't have it, but then at least I didn't have to contact you. Yeah, I, I, what I'll do is I'll email everyone that's connected yeah. and I'll, I'll send you the link. Yeah. 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 Yeah.